gospel text on the Transfiguration from Luke chapter 9. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to, the, to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a seat. <laughs> Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from the one who is, who was, and who is to come again, our risen living Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. I remember an innocent conversation with some classmates my middle year. We were talking about all the different forms of exegetical approaches, such as historical criticism, redaction, criticism, literary criticism, etc. And we wondered what could the scholars possibly come up with next? I mean, it seems to me that it would, eventually we would run out of criticisms. <laughs> so as we were brainstorming, somebody got creative and proposed an approach called voice inflection criticism. <laughs> we theorized that in this approach, we could talk about how the sound of a voice quoted in a text could influence interpretation. And so, for example, in today's text, if we were to hear the voice from the cloud, and if it sounded like this, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. <laughs> okay, if the voice truly sounded like that, then we would conclude in our interpretation that the voice reveals a God who is very passive aggressive toward the disciples. <laughs> now you're probably wondering what exactly was in our coffee that day. <laughs> But you have to understand that this conversation took place on a five-minute break from a two-hour Jewel and Kiefert tag team lecture. So, <laughs> As you can well imagine, our brains were pretty fried at the time. But there's a sense where I think we tend to hear an angry voice in this bizarre story. That is, we read into, or in this case, hear into the text, if you will, an angry voice that influences our interpretation. And so as a result, when we try to make sense of this story, we often point the finger at Peter, you know, who is responsible for bringing on this divine reprimand, or this so-called divine reprimand. And so Peter ends up getting too much of a bum rap, I think, as if there was an appropriate way for him to respond in such a situation. For Peter and for us, this voice is not a divine scolding. It is good news. A week after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, he get, Peter, along with James and John, receive a personal introduction from God that confirms, yes, indeed, this is my son. Peter's confession was not just a good guess. God himself confirms Christ's Messiahship. So isn't this perhaps the ultimate epiphany? There's no more doubt about it. Christ is the very Son of God. So that voice functions as good news, but it also scares the disciples out of their robes. 
Luke records that in those days they told no one any of the things they had said. But of course you can well imagine that after the resurrection and the Pentecost, these three broke their silence and told it enthusiastically as good news. In his second letter, Peter writes about the glorious event. This is what he has to say in retrospect. He says, We had been eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. For Peter, this indeed is good news. Now the problem for us is that there is nothing in our faith experience that parallels this almost surreal story. How can we relate to such an epiphany of God's glory? I remember one of my professors telling me that a good sermon is one that is preached in such a way that it does the text to the hearers. Do the text to the hearers and you got yourself a good sermon which I think is a good idea, but in this case, my response is, shah. <laughs> I mean, I think we see the futility in trying to draw parallels from everyday experience with this awesome and mysterious event. So what I suggest is that all of us have climbed miniature mountains of transfiguration, or molehills of transfiguration might be more accurate. That is to say that God has revealed his son to us in less spectacular ways. Call it a religious experience, call it what you will. But nonetheless, God has revealed his son and revealed his son in such a way that it changed us. The seminary experience is the mountain or the miniature mountain of transfiguration that I'd like to consider. Only on this mini mountain, you are the one who is transfigured. That is to say that it is you who undergo a metamorphosis in your time spent here. Now, I don't know if any of you have considered seminary as a religious experience. <laughs> in fact, I'm not sure what the words religious experience mean to us Lutherans, not to mention what a religious experience would look like at this seminary. I mean, you can use your imaginations. Some of you cynics might respond that a religious experience on this campus might be something like the systematics department organizing for themselves a small group solely for the purposes of sharing their feelings. <laughs> Shame on you cynics. <laughs> but consider this. No matter how long your stay is at Luther Seminary, God is changing you. Not quite as dramatically as he changed the disciples on the glorious mountain, but God is still changing you. You come here and you see Jesus in a different light, so to speak. You come here and you study the gospel as it comes into conversation with the law and with prophecy, and new insights are gained. And then there is the matter of the voices that you hear at this mini mountain of transfiguration. You may have noticed in Peter's second letter that he was more impressed with the voice of God than anything else. There's no mention of Moses or Elijah, no biblical dream team or anything like that. He is just fascinated with the awe of that voice. Now I know you and I would like to hear the power of that voice. But what about the powerful voices that you hear at this seminary? Okay, there's no comparison, but the voices that... <laughs> the voices that you hear at this place are influencing you greatly. And it is especially these voices that have effected change in you. Once I am long gone from this place, I will never forget the voice of one Dr. James Arnie Nestigan. I can imagine sitting at my computer preparing a sermon, recalling his voice. Satan is tempting you to preach law, Kurtz. Hmm? <laughs> and so he wants to turn you into Moses so that you will get into the pulpit and accuse hmm? you, 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 you. <laughs> And 
That's one voice that has changed me. <laughs> and then when I am considering my audience, I'll be mindful of the fact that I'll be preaching to modern people, triggering the unforgettable voice of Dr. Walter Sundberg. What is the definition of a modern person? Someone who forms his or her ideals apart from external authority. <laughs> what are the voices that have changed you? What are the voices that you recall as you serve in your given baptismal vocation? Some of you will face ethical decisions in the church, and you'll try to remember what Dr. Jim Burton has said about ethics, and so you'll have to ask yourself whether it's possible to make ethical decisions using a methodology of deliberation that is essentially either teleological, theontological, situational, or a character ethic. <laughs> Then there's the worship committee, some of whom will argue against singing the psalms while others demand an alternative worship. And Dr. Paul Westermeyer's voice will ring in your ears. First of all, the psalms are meant to be sung. And secondly, there's no such thing as alternative worship. <laughs> And finally, there are those difficult philosophical questions. But what is ambiguity, Pastor? And what was that unforgettable quote by Dr. Paul Sponheim? Ambiguity is the epistemological correlate to the ontological reality of freedom. <laughs> These are some of the many voices that have changed you, changed you perhaps beyond all recognition. But the voices that you hear at this place are also the voices that have nourished you in the faith. God is at work using the voices at this seminary to prepare you to give greater voice to the gospel of Christ. In fact, God has been using normal voices all along to effect faith in you. All of you are here at worship today because God introduced his son to you through someone's voice. It was an ordinary voice that declared you baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps it was a voice of a friend that brought you back to the church. God is using such voices to look after you, to assure you that you belong in God's kingdom. As we undergo this metamorphosis on this miniature mountain of transfiguration, there are other voices that function quite profoundly, if you listen carefully. Seniors just found out about regional assignment, and now it will be the voices of bishops and call committees that determine much of our future. How are voices functioning for you? Perhaps you are using your voice to teach a child how to speak or how to read. Maybe it is a louder voice that you need as you visit the elderly and exchange stories. Or perhaps it is a voice over the phone that is of particular importance to you, sustaining you in relationship. Of course, not all voices are quite so pleasant. It is often a voice over the phone that informs us of tragedy and death. Many in this community and thousands in our church will miss the voice of Bill Hume. Then there are those voices that are less than audible, voices that reside in your conscience. I know you hear a lot of joking around here about how quote-unquote humbling the Bible exam can be. But I have a hunch that behind the voices of cynicism and defensive humor, there may very well be relentless voices of self-doubt. The devil will be quick to amplify such voices into a fury of condemnation. There will be a barrage of voices that continually doubt you. Are you teaching the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Voices that question whether you belong here, 
voices that protest your vocation or your capacity to serve, even voices that question God's mercy. Can I really be forgiven for that? It is at such times when we long to hear the voice of God, times when we would like some divine confirmation. But the power of that voice has been made known to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the good news of the gospel is that our God is so down to earth, so involved in his creation, so after you, that he uses ordinary voices like mine to declare to you that your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. Christ's love for you is greater than those condemning voices. There is no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. And now God is using your voices as a means of introducing his son to the world. Our voices that can be so prone to sin and aggression and misuse, God is using for God's epiphany because God has redeemed you in Christ. It was through that voice on the big mountain of transfiguration that God revealed to humanity in certain terms that Jesus is God impersonated. And as they come down from the mountain and head toward Jerusalem, God subjects his son to the voice of humanity, a collective voice that shouts out, crucify him. The transfiguration may tell of the ultimate manifestation of Christ's divinity in this season of revelation, but it's emphatically not the ultimate epiphany. The ultimate epiphany for you and for all is yet to come. It is when Christ returns in his glory to come for you. And then you will hear that voice, the same voice that introduced the Son to the world is the same voice that you will hear as it calls you out of the graves and tells you that it's time to celebrate. May the power of that voice set us free to use our voices for God's glory, to proclaim the good news, the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord to the world. Amen.